As we step into the third term of the Modi government, uh, it's uh, interesting to get a variety of voices on what can be expected. And uh, the next person that we're speaking to is a complete authority on the Indian economy. We're speaking with Pranjul Bhandari. Uh, she is a chief India economist at HSBC. Pranjul, great to speak with you once again on NDTV Profit and uh, have you back on. Since this is top of mind, let me begin with your take on Modi 3.0. I mean, markets had their own expectations priced in, which is why we saw the wild gyrations during result week, etc. But now that that heat and dust has calm, calmed down to some extent and we're back to business, interested in knowing your take on what exactly do you hope to see from the third term of the Modi government? Well, you know, um, you know, I'll talk about what I think we'll see. I think we'll see a lot of continuity. I think a couple of things that Prime Minister Modi really championed over the last couple of years will continue. And these include things like, you know, a push to public capex. Now, true, when you're bringing down the fiscal deficit, you don't have too much cash available to do more and more infrastructure. But you can rope in the public sector enterprises, which haven't been doing too much, you know, in from over the last couple of years. So overall, that public sector capex push remains, even though a lot more happens, you know, from the public sector enterprises than the budget outlays. You know, I see a lot more of the support to futuristic sectors to continue. Uh, we started with electronics, uh, semiconductors, perhaps more of. EVs and green hydrogen going ahead, data centers, artificial intelligence. My sense is, you know, all of that, you know, will continue. And also an eye on macro stability. Now, this government in the past has shown as much love for macro stability as it has for growth. And things like gradually bringing down the fiscal deficit to make sure that over time inflation aligns with target. I think all of these things which are needed to ensure growth stays high for multiple years and not just one or two years, I think that focus will continue as well. So a lot of business as usual. And my sense is this kind of reforms aligns or maps with a GDP growth number of about six and a half percent over the medium term, over a, even a five to 10 year horizon. So I think we're still on that track where I thought we were a month ago. Now, a few things that I think may not happen as much uh, and one of them is legislative reforms like farm laws, land laws, labor laws. But the truth is we were anyway not doing it in the last couple of years. So my sense is, you know, that part, maybe, you know, I'm, I would love to be surprised on the upside, but perhaps will remain a bit slow. But all the other things which I think happen via executive action, like public capex and so on and so forth, I think that continues. Okay, so that's that's a great sort of, uh, you know, setting the stage uh, for what could be expected. Let me come on, uh, come to you on a couple of specific things. One is the kind of spends that we would see in schemes that sometimes are described as populist as a response to the election result, which has seen a continuation in government, no doubt, has seen Modi become prime minister for the third term, no doubt, but with the help on, and aid of allies. Now, while you know, people are trying to decode what the election results are saying in terms of rural distress, etc. Do you see more spends directed in putting more money in the pockets of rural Indians and urban Indians, also the middle class, etc.? Well, look, uh, this is the, a government which wants to bring down the fiscal consolidation, which wants to bring down the fiscal deficit and follow a fiscal consolidation path. And I don't think that's at risk. I think that is something that will continue. Uh, but within the boundaries of fiscal consolidation, whenever the government gets access to some more revenues, like it has in the last couple of months, you know, it's got 2 trillion rupees of I, uh, RBI dividend, it wasn't expecting that much, then I think a part of that will go for welfare spending. Now, uh, my sense is that the RBI dividend surprised on the upside by about 0.4% of GDP. And my sense then and today is that about half of that will go for welfare spending. When I say welfare spending, I don't mean any new schemes that will bankrupt the government. I basically mean just replenishing some schemes that were already there, but had been under provisioned for in the interim budget that would be better provision for, you know, in the next budget. 0.2, 0 0.3% of GDP doesn't really move the needle. You know, it's not a profligate budget, irresponsible budget at all. So my sense is, yes, within the fiscal consolidation path. The second thing that doesn't really 
cost the government too much but can add to growth, can add, add to social welfare, is spending more regularly. You know, what we saw over the last couple of years was the government trying to do some reforms on digitization of payments, even government payments. And because of that, regular payments were not being made. And a lot of our tax revenues, which the government was collecting, was lying locked up with the RBI for 10, 11 months in a row. Perhaps spending that a little more regularly, finding out a mechanism to do that, you don't spend any more, or you just spend more efficiently than before. I think that could also be a part of the strategy, and I think we, are, we will be lucky to have that. You know, another thing that this government needs to be seen to be doing is working constructively on creating more jobs. Now, at the end of the day, the issue of quality employment became, uh, you know, a rallying cry during the election. It comes up once every few years. But what are the kind of schemes they could announce or what is in the boundary of what government can actually do to, um, you know, uh, create more jobs or seem to be working towards creating more jobs? Look, I think at the end of the day, it's all about getting more reforms done. You know, the things like which are difficult, which are controversial, like farm laws, labor laws, uh, land laws, uh, all of these, getting all of this happening, I think is probably the most important thing. I'm going to take a step back and quickly explain how I look at it. You know, I think about it as two Indias, new India and old India. New India is fast growing. It has high tech manufacturing. It has services exports. It's 15% of GDP. It has been growing at 15% per year, really driving growth. And I think that part of India continues. The only problem is it doesn't create as many jobs. And then you have the old India, which is 85% of GDP. It comprises agriculture and small firms, uh, and it employs a bulk of India's people, and it has not been growing as rapidly. The challenge is to lift old India. So you either lift old India via reforms, land, labor, ease of doing business, farm, or mechanisms via which private sector and new India can lift old India, like access to credit, fintech, agri-tech, things like that. And honestly, we need all of this to come together. But eventually, I think India's jobs problem will continue until we do some of these more complex reforms and get these bills passed in the legislature. Yeah, yeah. So getting the bills passed may not be that tough right now, at least with the majority they have in the Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, we'll, you know, we'll have to wait and see how elections also pan out in states. But I want to come to the point of the next budget, Pranjul, and I'm in, in keen in knowing what, what you think in terms of where the government capex outlay will lie. We saw a muted number as expected in the interim budget, the big guns being reserved for July. Uh, what is your own estimate at that number and do you think fiscal deficit targets will be met? Well, look, I don't think, you know, anything was reserved in the interim budget. You know, capex still had an outlay growing 17% year on year. This is at a time when your fiscal deficit is being brought down sharply from 5.6, 5.8% to 5.1%. Despite that, you had a thrust on public capex. So it was clearly a priority of the government in the interim budget. And I, my sense is that outlay number is not going to change in the final budget that we see, because it's anyway a pretty impressive number. So uh, really no changes there. Uh, a little bit on social welfare, perhaps, you know, 0.2% of GDP or so, nothing that is, you know, out of the charts. I think uh, quite a responsible number. And overall fiscal deficit target being met. You know, we had a, we for FY25, there's a target of 5.1% fiscal deficit. And my sense is we may actually even better it. We could do like 5% and that would be a upside surprise to the bond market. So my sense is that the budget will continue to show a responsibility, you know, bringing down the fiscal deficit while still, you know, having a, a soft corner for public capex. I think that will continue. And I think that's the best signal you can even give to the RBI that the fiscal is doing its job. Uh, now monetary policy doesn't have to worry about fiscal and monetary can think about its own inflation management. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll come to RBI because we, we heard from the governor uh, last week and, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting to see what cues we're getting there. But just one more on this point, on, on the economy first, Pranjul, and I want to get your view on private capex. Now, that's sort of the X factor, which, uh, you know, we've been waiting in the wings for it to actually kick up. It's showing signs of revival, no doubt. Do you see enough out there for private cap capex to really kick up a notch now? Yeah, you know, that's a tricky question, to be honest. Uh, there's, there's domestic capex in the private sector and foreign capex. 
I think domestic capex parts of it is growing, but on the whole, it's not growing at a at a big rate. And I think one of the problems is that India's capacity utilization is still low. It's still, as per RBI data, about 75. Until it goes to 80 or higher, I don't see how domestic private capex can really come up in a major way. And if, to some extent, welfare spending can improve mass consumption demand, then maybe over time we can see capacity utilization rise and private domestic capex come in. So in a way, a little bit of welfare spending today could be a good thing to bring in private capex over the medium term. That's one part. The other part is foreign private capex. Mm. Now, foreign private capex hasn't been that great. You know, we've seen FDI fall in India. We've actually seen FDI fall in many parts of the world because the FDI pot globally has shrunk. Uh, the hope is that over time it rises back up. We are seeing a lot of investment intentions happening in India. Uh, uh, but India will have to keep wooing this FDI, you know, with ease of doing business, improvements, and things like that. I think they have to keep wooing this FDI to come into India because, to be honest, there are many countries wooing for the same pot of money. Yeah. So I think the, 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 my, my short point is that for both domestic and foreign private capex, we really have to work harder to get it really roaring. And, and do you think things like the PLI scheme will help? Uh, everyone's waiting to see the 100-day agenda first unveiled, and the PLI scheme has seen substantial success. So more in the same direction on the point you made on FDI? I think so. I think we'll see um, a, you know, a continued focus on PLI scheme. Now, remember, it's a new scheme, and every time the government is learning a few lessons, uh, I think there were issues on availability of imported inputs, uh, visas for engineers from you know other parts of the world and and I think all of those parts will get addressed uh, in the next couple of months so you know my sense is we might see a little bit more uptick in in the PLI success than we have in the past let me come now to the question of monetary policy and you've uh, laid it out beautifully on you know what we could see on the government side and uh, in terms of the fisc but now where does monetary policy lie so um, on the 7th of june for the eighth consecutive time the rbi held its rates as was widely expected um, inflation is pegged at about four and a half percent for this financial year where is the trigger going to come from Pranjul. And are we going to see the RBI sort of wait for the Federal Reserve to move possibly in September on rates? What is your sense here? So look, two big changes happen on the Friday monetary policy. Number one, for the first time, the RBI governor questioned the principle of following the Fed. Like, why should we follow the Fed? Our external accounts are pretty well buttressed. We have a large stock of FX reserves. So that was a very inter in interesting sort of new, new sort of statement that the RBI governor made. And the second was that two members of the MPC, the external members, voted for a rate cut and a change in stance uh, compared to just one uh, in the previous meeting. So I think this puts a little bit more pressure on the other NPC members that, hey, what are these people seeing which, which we are not seeing? So I think both of these were sort of very strong underlying currents pointing towards little more RBI dovishness going forward. My sense is RBI will be looking at three things going ahead before it starts cutting. Number one, the monsoon rains. If they continue to be strong in June and July, sowing is good, then it can make a case that one year ahead inflation will actually begin to fall. Uh, and I think that will lay out the path for rate cuts. Second, the budget. If the government follows the fiscal consolidation path, then that will give more confidence to the RBI on monetary policy easing. And third, neutral rates. Now, this is a slightly academic concept, but at every point in time, RBI has an estimate of where the real neutral rates in the economy should be. And vis-a-vis -vis that, we in the markets figure out if there is space to cut or not. At this juncture, some of the old estimates of the RBI have become outdated. The RBI has promised that in the next month or so, they're going to release their new estimates of neutral rates, and that will give us a sense if there is space to cut or not. If all of these three factors align, then my sense is that as early as August, we could get indications of loser monetary policy. Even if the cut doesn't happen in August, it happens in October. My sense is if these three factors align, the first indications will be available in August. Okay, so the first indications could come in in August. I think uh, that sort of shift in 
uh, parameters of why should we wait for the Fed is very, very important, as you explained, Pranjul. But having said that, uh, does inflation really seem like it's benign? Because especially food inflation tends to be a little unpredictable. We have a good monsoon uh, predicted for this year. It started off fairly well. Do you see a bit of a question mark or a bit of a challenge on that end? So look, core inflation, which is the part we've always been very worried about, has come off quite quite sharply, you know, uh, under 4%, and that's in a good place right now. The problem is food inflation, which is extremely elevated. But remember that, you know, one or two items can cause havoc, like, for example, vegetable prices growing 30% can really lift inflation. But we also get a new vegetable sh stock every two to three months. So inflation comes down as sharply as it rises. I think eventually the RBI really needs to monitor rains. It needs to monitor sowing, not just of vegetables and, ho and horticulture, but also of cereal, cereal and pulses, which have also been a little more inflationary. And if they are in terms with normal or surplus and rains are supportive, then my sense is a case can be made that over the next three to five months, food inflation will begin to fall. And on the back of that, the RBI can cut rates because anyway, transmission takes about two to three quarters. So if you're going to anyway see inflation fall in five months, might as well you know cut, cut, cut now. Uh, my point being, if monsoons are good, the RBI would rather it cut sooner than later. Rate cuts you're penciling in for this year? 50 basis points. So taking the repo rate from 6.5% to 6%, uh, I think is what we have. So it's a shallow rate cutting cycle uh, because, you know, given our inflation and our growth, we probably don't need that much. We also didn't hike that very much. So my sense is 50 basis points is pretty much, you know, uh, what we have space for. Till the end of the calendar year. That's right. Okay. Um, just uh, to get your sense on where we see the Fed moving, because that's, uh, and, and if we delink, it's actually good, because that's the one factor which is becoming very difficult to predict. Uh, are you on board with the September rate cut outlook? Yes, that is a house view, uh, to have, uh, you know, one rate cut this calendar year in September, and then three next year. So over a one-year horizon, we have four rate cuts. Yeah. So when the Fed moves four times, RBI moves two times, is, is how I see it. Okay, okay. That's an interesting uh, sort of indicator. Just, you know, as we wrap up this fascinating conversation, uh, Pranjul, want to get an overview from you on what are the challenges that India is going to be seeing economically? Do you see a resurgent China as one in the context of attracting FDI and FII flows? Uh, do you see geopolitical issues as a big headwind? Or are we rather secure in where we're heading? Well, look, it's an ever-changing global backdrop. Uh, and I think uh, what India will have to do really well is to basically have a very outgoing and bold foreign policy, uh, making friends, uh, having trade in the, trade and investment pacts, like, for example, we've been having with the Middle East. I think India has made a lot of effort to woo the Middle East, Europe, the US, and I think all of that must continue. But at the same time, we have to think very carefully about our own uh, industrial policy. At this point, you know, we want to focus on many PLI sectors, but we are also increasing import tariffs. We may have to bring down a lot of import tariffs because for PLI to succeed, they need access to cheaper imported inputs. So I think we really need to align our taxation with the industrial policy you know, that we are talking about. So I think we really need to think through all of these very clearly and then you know, woo uh, more uh, you know, foreign partners because that's the way to go. All right. Thank you so much, Pranjul Bhandari. Pleasure as always to speak with you and hope to chat with you soon. Great to be here. Thank you for having me.